And you should all receive a message saying that this is important and it's um, All right. Um, one last thing the information presented by Midwest Tribal or BIA staff, including national standard requirements, policy, and procedures, may include experience, guidance, policy, and procedures that are established in practice specific to the Midwest region. Therefore, we do not claim to override the national agenda, policy, or procedures, and cannot be responsible for any deviation from another region or an agency within another region. If you are attending from outside the Midwest region, please contact your local BIA office for any questions. In closing, thank you for participating in the 2021 Partners in Action Conference. And now I will introduce the presenter. Please welcome Sandy Portia, Regional Director. Good morning, everyone, um, and welcome to the introduction to the BIA. Um, I wanted to um, just kind of talk about the different levels as we open up today of the programs. And yesterday, if you attended the um, BI history, there were um, several organization charts that were shown um, during that session. Um, John Blackhair spoke and we had Bart Stevens um, that also spoke about the, the different levels. And um, with that, when we discuss the programs today, you're going to be hearing um, from the perspective of the regional office. Um, but we should also be aware that these same programs are managed out of central office, regional offices, and agency offices under the direction of, um, of the superintendents. So um, this course is intended um, to inform new tribal representatives, tribal leaders, and if you, in a few, um, aren't new, but just are looking for more information, I think it's going to be a great opportunity. So to understand better um, of what we do, I do know a lot of the tribal legal counsel um, are very aware of our programs, and we work with them on a daily basis at the regional office. In the event that we have um, an appeal or a decision in front of us um, for fee to trust. Um, so they are very well aware of it, and I, I know a lot of the tribal leaders out there um, are probably not as informed on what we do and um, how we uh, provide technical assistance, that type of thing, to um, to the programs with the tribes or internally. A lot of our program staff on today's call that will be presenting work with the tribal programs um, directly every day and um, that's part of our process and how we get things done so with that patty i'm going to go ahead and um, turn it right over to um to, you know moving the um overview today um forward so thank you so much and welcome to introduction to bia Oh, okay. um, thanks, Tammy. So, um, Tammy, of course, is the regional director for the Midwest region. Um, and then I am Patricia Olby. I am the deputy regional director of press services. And then we have Chris Redman, deputy regional director of Indian services. And you're probably asking what is the difference between press services and Indian services? And we'll get into that. In a little bit. So the BIA mission statement is to enhance the quality of life, to promote economic opportunity, and to carry out the responsibility to protect the interests and trust assets of American Indian, Indian tribes, and Alaska Natives. And so um, when you hear mission critical anything, um, this is where it falls in our work would have to be done to support the mission statement. So the tribes serve uh, Midwest region, we serve 36 federally recognized tribes um, within Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Iowa. Um, the Midwest region office directly serves, that means um, the, the listing of tribes there that you see um, we provide the direct services as if we were an agency. Um, 
to those to those tribes were. Right now, I'm going to introduce to Jason Overly, superintendent at Michigan Agency, um, to discuss talk about his agency. Jason. All right, so Jason Oberly, his the Michigan agency is located in Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, and their office directly provides services to the tribes that you see listed there. Um, I believe there's 11. Um, he has a very small, small staff located at Michigan, but um, worked very, very hard. Next, we're going to go to Minnesota Agency. Their office is located in Bemidji, and I'm going to turn it over to Alan Fulberty, the superintendent. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Well, good morning. Uh, thank you all for attending this session. Uh, the Minnesota agency is located in in uh, northern north central Minnesota, Bemidji, Minnesota, and serves as the headquarters from which the Bureau's trust responsibility to the six federally recognized member bands of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe is carried out. The six member bands of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, which are located in northern and central regions of Minnesota, are Boys Fort Band, Fond du Lac Band, Grand Portage Band, Leech Lake Band, Mille Lacs Band, and White Earth Band. The Office of the Superintendent is charged with the authority and responsibility for the daily management of the varied programs and inherent federal responsibilities associated with the management of the agency resources. The office provides overall program planning, staffing, execution and coordination of bureau programs administered on behalf of the six federally recognized MCT bands within its jurisdiction. All six bands operate their programs under self self governance compacts. Assistance is provided to tribes in contract administration, real estate services, probate and estate services, forestry and fire management, tribal government, program administration, self-determination, self-governance services, road construction, delivery of direct services, and fulfillment of the federal government's trust responsibilities. And that is my brief overview for Minnesota Agency. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Next, we're going to move on to Great Lakes Agency, located in Ashland, Wisconsin. Diane Davis is in here. Uh, Diane, you're on mute. <laughs> You'd think I'd have that all figured out by now. Good morning, everyone. My apologies. Uh, my name is Diane Baker, and I'm a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians and have been superintendent since March 2020 uh, with 21 years of experience or 31 years of experience. I also served for four years with the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Um, it compacted the realty program, so I managed their realty office as a realty director for about four years. Uh, the Great Lakes Agency was established in 1894 at La Pointe on Madeline Island in the Schwamigan Bay of Lake Superior, which is the largest freshwater lake in the world. Uh, and the agency has been located in Ashland since 1943 uh, on the southern shore of Lake of Schwamigan Bay. And until the mid 1970s, the agency provided direct services to all Wisconsin and Michigan tribes. Currently, the agency is responsible for the government-to-government -government relationship with 10 of the 11 federally recognized Wisconsin tribes that include the six bands of the Lake Superior Chippewa, 
as well as the Potawatomi, the Ho-Chunk Oneida, and Stockbridge Muncie. Specifically, the agency assists with management and oversight of trust assets, uh, providing services to the Wisconsin tribal entities and the individual Indians uh, in support of self-governance, also in support of self-governance and self-determination activities. Um, there's approximately 44 Great Lakes Agency staff, and on any given day, Monday through Friday, 25% uh, of the staff are on location as is federally mandated um, in the current pandemic status uh, with the remainder of time and staff posturing and telework status. Um, agency trust programs include uh, real estate services, uh, probate and estate planning, forestry, uh, natural resources, and um, and the Indian Services Program that includes self-determination and tribal operations and social services. Uh, social services, the social services program is coordinated by the agency uh, at, with the region, at the regional level. Uh, also housed at um, the agency uh, are the Bureau of Trust Fund Administration, which we've all known as, uh, formerly as the Office of Special Trustee or OST, uh, the Office of Appraisal and Valuation. The Midwest region has both the Land Titles and Records Office and Roads Program located there as well. Uh, I have to say I'm diligent in my role as Superintendent uh, Program Manager of the Great Lakes Agency to carry out the Bureau's mission and to develop processes to assure that services are streamlined and provided efficiently, complying with all applicable laws, regulations, and ordinances to include those at the tribal level and coordinating also with our uh, partner federal agencies or partnering with those fe other federal agencies. Uh, admittingly, there are hiccups uh, due to vacancies and training needs as well as the, the current pandemic, although we've gotten better at doing business as we are today uh, in telework, a majority in telework status. Um, I fully support the staff and our tribal partners, so we have the resources necessary for success. Uh, in any event, I'm available by email at diane.baker at bia.gov or uh, telephone, and the best number is my mobile, 612-816-9626. Uh, if there's any questions or needs for uh, any kind of assistance, uh, the main line to the agency is 715 682 4527. Uh, agency staff um, are also available to provide technical assistance and to help tribes meet training needs and or to locate uh, resources as well. Um, and we do have a large number of allotments and individ individual owners. So a lot of our work is done one on one with uh, individual owners as well and then providing technical assistance to those uh, tribal entities that have compacted or contracted uh, realty programs or any programs for that matter. Um, together we can achieve more, together we can succeed. Uh, that's my motto and I stand behind that uh, 100%. Uh, whatever we can do to get the job done together and get it done well. Um, always willing to sit at the table at any time um, uh, especially in sharing of information that can help um, uh, the movement of transactions from beginning, uh, you know, on the tribal end to when it comes into the BIA and then moving forward to completion. Uh, I look forward to the opportunity for more information and discussion in the session later on today, streamlining BIA processes. Uh, and that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thanks, Diane. Okay, with that, I'm going to pause right here and just open it up for any questions. Hi, Patty. Hello? Hello? This is Jason Oberly. I'm on the line now. Oh, okay. I'm going to go back to your slide. All right. Um, Jason Oberly, Superintendent for Michigan Agency. Good morning, everybody. Sorry for the delay. I My schedule got a little crossed up this morning. I was busy with other things. Um, I just want to take the opportunity to introduce myself. Um, I'm a member of the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe of Chippewa Indians. 
I took this post here at the Michigan Agency in March of 2014. I guess I could turn my camera on for you too, I suppose. I took this post here in March of 2014. Prior to that, I worked in the Northwest region as a safety and highway planning expert for the tribal transportation program. It was the Indian Reservations Roads program back then. Um, let me see, Michigan Agency still still operates, you know, 8 to 4.30, Monday through Friday, except for holidays. We have about 25% of our staff coming in regularly, following the presidential guidelines, and we are happy to serve. I don't know if there's any questions for me. I Got to admit, I'm a little flustered because I was going in so many different directions. That I was scatterbrained. I got a message from someone going, well, you're supposed to be presenting right now. And I'm like, I am. And I was like, OK, so I had to rush and find a link and get on here. And uh, my, I accept full responsibility for my lack of preparedness. I was I was working diligently at another project. I'm trying to get closed up. So uh, that's uh, that's all I got. I know that we've had a bunch of, you know, with, since the new administration has come in, we've been, uh, you know, really working at pushing the, the feet of trust through and getting getting that all lined up. And I know that we sent out our quarterlies just recently, so all 12 of our tribes should have recently gotten a letter from this office talking about the status of their feet of trust cases. And I know that my leasing staff has been just going to town with, uh, you know, NEPA compliance and leasing approvals because I've been in and out of TAMS the last couple of weeks like it's going out of style. I think they're working double time around the 4th of July holiday and I'm not really sure why. I am exaggerating just a little bit, but uh, they, they've had a lot of paperwork for me to sign and uh, a lot of in and out of TAMS. So I think those are good things because that means people are getting into homes and that's always a good thing. So if anybody's got any questions, I'd love to hear them. Otherwise, I don't have anything else I can tell you. Right off the top of my head. Thanks, Jason. All right, right now I'm going to pause, and if anybody has any questions for our superintendent, uh, now it's time to ask before we get into the nitty gritty of some of the programs. Any hands up out there? I'm not seeing any, um, anything in the chat. I don't see any questions, Patty. Okay. All right. Well, let's just move ahead. Um, okay. So the rest of the presentation is broken out um, into a couple of different categories. And within those categories are different programs. And at the end of each program area, we'll be pausing for any questions that you that you may have. So feel free to use your um, hands up or type in the chat if you're too shy to turn the microphone on. Um, that's just fine. So as, as mentioned before, I am the Deputy Regional Director for Trust Services, and I oversee these program areas here, real estate services, probate, division of duty trust, Land Title and Records Office, which is that office is physically located at Great Lakes Agency, as Ellen had mentioned. Um, forestry, fire, water and dam safety, wildlife parks, and GIS. Um, we also have, um, I'm going to ask Chris to pop in. Chris Redman is our um, Deputy Regional Director of Indian Services. Chris? Yeah, good morning, and once again, welcome. Uh, my name is Chris Redman. I'm a member of the Chickasaw Nation of Oklahoma and the Deputy Regional Director for Indian Services for the Midwest region. I took over this post about March of this year. Prior to that, I was a superintendent for the Seminole Tribe of Florida, and about seven years prior to that, uh, with the Bureau of Indian Education. This morning, it's my pleasure to introduce to you the Midwest Region Indian Service branches and leadership. Following my short introduction and later during this presentation, you're going to hear a more in-depth overview from the, tri uh, the programs and services uh, that each of them provide. Real quickly, uh, the Indian Services mission is to facilitate 
support for the tribal people and tribal governments by promoting safety and quality living environments, strong communities, self-sufficient and individual rights while enhancing protection of the lives, prosperity and well-being of American Indians and Alaska Natives. The Midwest Region Indian Services is made up of about approximately seven areas. The branch of administration includes finance, property and acquisitions. Administrative officer is Christine Bessina. The branch of budget is uh, Scott Cameron. Human Services, Valerie Vasquez. Tribal Operations, Cheryl LaPointe and acting uh, regional facility manager and regional safety manager is Jerry Doolittle. We have the environmental branch, Scott Doig, Doig excuse me, branch of self-determination, branch chief, Michelle Corbin, branch of transportation, Todd Kennedy, and the housing program or HIP, which is yours truly. OK, that concludes my introduction. Patty, thank you. Thanks, Chris. OK, so now um, speak at what the next slide is here. Trust service programs. So we're going to get into the weeds a little bit. Um, this is a high level overview of um, trust service programs, and they will be presented by each of the program managers. And first off, we have real estate services. Merville Harris is our branch program manager for that program. Merville? Thank you, Patty. Uh, just a quick uh, note about myself. I worked for the Bureau uh, for 33 years. Uh, worked in five of the 12 uh, BIA regional offices across the nation been regional realty officer for four years in Alaska, regional realty officer in the Pacific region for six years. And this is my second stint at the Midwest region. Originally from 2006 to 2014, I was the lockbox liaison. And uh, for almost a year now, I have been back as the regional realty officer. So as um, regional director Poitra and uh, some of the other superintendents had mentioned, these programs spread out all the way down to the agency. So this is just the general overview of what real estate services does. In the regional office, uh, I have two staff, Tom Wilkins and Juanita Walker. They're both realty specialists. And the thing about these two individuals is they both serve on national uh, user group teams. Tom is with the mortgage user group uh, national team and Juanita Walker is with the lockbox liaison. Uh, national user group team. So uh, although we've, I've only got two staff right now, we're able to at least manage the workload and uh, keep our transactions moving and things working, okay? Regional real uh, estate services uh, and real estate services generally um, pri have primary responsibilities, which include to assist and support the real estate services programs at our agencies within the Midwest region. We've heard from the superintendents, you know, what those programs involve, and of course they involve real estate services. Uh, we heard earlier from, um, or we saw on one of the slides that we do provide direct services to seven tribes uh, out of the region. And uh, uh, part of our mission is to assist all tribes within the Midwest region in regard to real estate services and other trust services activities. We also work with other BIA programs in regard to services uh, provided to the agencies and to the tribes uh, in regard to upholding our trust responsibility. Now, this is just a general view of the transactions that are managed and, and handled within real estate services. Leasing, uh, we uh, process agriculture, residential, business, wind and solar leases, and we haven't had to yet, but um, tribes that have taken uh, the Hearth Act, advantage of the Hearth Act, and are able to approve their own leases, 
can ask the Bureau for assistance in certain instances. So we can provide that service to them when it comes uh, to their hard tax leases. We do have to record their leases, which entails a little bit, but uh, that is also helping other tribes that have taken that function. Uh, we also process trust uh, a fee to trust applications, both gaming and non-gaming. Uh, when you start and you work with your agencies, which is the place to start the, uh, uh, the agency that provides administ administrative services to your tribe uh, is the place to start. They work with the region and then we work with the offices of Indian Gaming and, and process them at the region if we need to. We also do trusted trust transactions, gift deeds, uh, land exchanges, trusted trust and trusted fee land sales. We also process partitions and we also process broadband rights away applications, utilities rights away applications and other rights away applications. And as we heard yesterday in the opening remarks and we'll see throughout the conference that broadband is a high priority of, of this administration. Uh, we also assist in uh, managing trespass cases um, where we can. Uh, we do have a presentation uh, during the conference on trespass proposals. Uh, and we also enter and track all of our transactions in the trust asset and accounting management system, the Bureau of System of Record, which we all refer to as TAMS. Now, the thing about TAMS is tribes can take that function if they, if they so choose. So that is an opportunity uh, for tribes to manage that particular system. And then, of course, we provide technical assistance to Midwest contract and compact tribes. So this is just the general transactions that we do. There are a number of other uh, land issues that we um, are involved with. There's legislative land transfers, um, exchanges, uh, fee to trust, trust to fee exchanges, and there's um, uh, other transactions that um, real estate services is involved with. We work close with our other programs within the Bureau. We work closely with the Bureau of Land Management, Indian Land Surveyor, and um, also with our DECRAMS and environmental staff in regard to all of these transactions that you see here on the screen. So that's a lot just in a, in, in a nutshell of what Realty does. That's, I guess, our general transactions but there are a number of other things that, that uh, real estate services handles. This is our contact information. The best way to get in touch with us uh, is by email. You see our email uh, addresses there and our phone numbers. Um, we are certainly um, glad to assist wherever we can. And I'm sure likewise, when you work with your agencies, they will do, do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Mervo. And um, just for everybody's awareness, you will be provided with a copy of this presentation after the session. Additionally, this is being recorded and will be posted on a public site after the conference is finished. Um, so you all have access that way as well. Um, so right now I'm going to pause for any questions for real estate services. I'm not seeing anybody in the chat. chat. Um, okay, I'm not seeing any. Um, don't be afraid to raise your hand or use um, the chat feature. Uh, the session is yours, so um, we encourage participation. Um, all right, I'm going to move forward. Um, and um, next program that we'll be talking is um, Gwendolyn Johns. Um, she is acting right now as the um, program manager um, for the vacancy, um, as well as Mandy Peaceful. Um, they're both sharing duties um, that way. So, uh, Lynn. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Gwen Johns. I go by Gwen. Um, and uh, right now, as Patty said, I am uh, in acting for the manager position at the Midwest Regional Office Probate. And Mandy Priester and I, um, we both take up the 
uh, issues that come up in um, just making the program run a little bit smoother or, you know, with no issues. Um, also under the Midwest Regional Office, uh, we have three agencies. Uh, we have the Minnesota Agency, which is where I uh, am the manager of the probate department there. Um, at the Great Lakes Agency, we have Mary Valeski, who is um, acting in that position until um, the vacancy is filled. Uh, over at Michigan, we have Tracy Gurno, who is um, the legal administrative specialist there. You see by the names, they have LAS and that's legal administrative specialist. And um, all these individuals are the managers of their respective uh, agencies. And uh, under uh, the probate and estate services, the regional office, right now uh, we have two staff members. Uh, we have one vacancy, and uh, I think we ha might have another vacancy. But right now, two individuals are uh, operating on a full time basis, which would be Mandy and Josh. Uh, they do serve seven tribes directly. Uh, the Great Lakes Agency, at this moment, they have four staff members. They serve 10 tribes, uh, one of which is a compact tribe, and I believe that's Oneida. Uh, the Minnesota Agency, we have six uh, staff members, and um, we service six tribes, bands. And one of those bands has compacted the, the probate um, program function. Uh, over at Michigan, they have uh, two probate staff members, and they service uh, 14 tribes um, under them, too. Um, so all in all, we got a great group of probate staff members. They all work together, uh, you know, handle the issues that come up. And um, just a really great group of people. Uh, OK, what does probate do? Uh, the primary function of probate is to collect the family data um, such as documents, birth, uh, death records, adoptions, wills, and we've researched the family information uh, to the best that we can. We submit that over to our op judge office of hearings and appeals, and um, they will take that and uh, determine whether or not it's acceptable. Most often it is, and or else they'll let us know if they need more information. And the Office of Hearings and Appeals, uh, their judges, they'll determine who is going to be receiving the assets that we probate. And the assets that we probate uh, in our department is trust assets, land and our money held in trust by the United States government. Um, this land is only trust land. It's not uh, county land. It's a land held within um, interest. So uh, moving along, I uh, already went over, you know, we submit all the documents and sometimes our probate packages, our research efforts, um, our probate packages can be anywhere from half an inch thick to 10 inches thick and um, just to show all the family research that goes into uh, a probate package. Uh, we're very detailed. Um, we also work very closely uh, with the realty department. We work close with, as you know, Office of Hearings and Appeals, the land titles and records who handle the land, the distribution of land and everything else that comes with land. Uh, we work closely with BTFA, uh, Bureau of Trust Funds Administration. Two, uh, we also monitor closely when a decision order comes in on a probate case from OHA uh, to ensure that um, the heirs are properly identified. We ensure that the distribution is done according to what we uh, decipher in the order. Um, so we make sure that the distribution is uh, accurately done also. And in probate, uh, everything runs on time, on a time uh, frame. 
uh, example would be once a decision order is made by the judge, we have 10 days to um, move the case on to the next level. From there, we have um, uh, 45 days from the date that uh, the order comes in to move it over to LTRO to make sure the land is um, distributed. Once LTRO, who was very swift at um, doing their job and accurately, will move it over to BTFA so the uh, IM accounts can be distributed. And once they've done that, uh, BTFA, we can actually close out the case. So it's kind of kind of a long process, but um, we're just ensuring that everything is done accurately and in a timely manner as well. Uh, the probate uh, realities at this time, uh, we have an active caseload of 6,623 cases. Uh, 3,569 of those are waiting uh, case preparation, meaning uh, if it's in case, case preparation, it's sitting on the side waiting for somebody to pick it up and start researching. Um, some of these cases are really old, I believe, and I can speak of Minnesota right now because that's where I'm, I'm most familiar with, but right now I think we have a case that goes back to 19, 1908 where the person has passed away. So we got to do some major digging on that. And it's a lot of time and effort, but very interesting. Um, uh, another reality is that uh, with the continued decrease in funding for probate staffing, the region's backlog of cases continues to grow. And um, I'll just go into that a little bit um, again for Minnesota, say that we complete uh, 25 cases to OHA for the month of um, any given month. And let's say there's uh, 50 deaths that report, we report um, under the jurisdiction of Minnesota. Um, we have 25 cases that over, we went over with the death then we could actually submit to um, OHA. And then the funding, we don't have enough funding to um, uh, employ as many people as we actually need. So we're just, we're doing the best we can, and but it's also a very um, a, a, a interesting area to be in, uh, probate. Uh, let's see, a state not prepared and adjudicated in a timely manner um, means that the title is not going to be updated, it's not going to be current uh, because uh, it's taken so long to get some of these cases done that the title is not accurate. Like if there's a land buyback um, that comes into place, uh, the title will have to be reconciled, make sure everything is um, in place. So that's one of the hindrances of um, a probate not being done on time. Um, the next slide I'm going to talk about is the American Indian Probate Reform Act of 2004. And what that basically means is that anybody that dies on or after July 20th of 2004, their trust estates are going to be affected by uh, the APRA Act, also known as APRA. Uh, this affects the ownership rights of trust or restricted lands. Um, uh, federally approved tribal probate code supersedes the uh, APRA Act. Um, tribes do have the option of creating their own probate code, and we'll go into that a little bit. We have uh, three sessions uh, during this PIA conference with probate. Uh, Mandy Priester will be given two of them, and I'll be given one on uh, purchase that probate. So uh, we'll be sure and address that for any tribes or bands that want to get into um, creating their own probate code. And we are, the we are here to help. Anybody has any questions, by all means, reach out to us. Um, I'll go over our contact information a little bit, a little bit later again. Uh, we promote consolidation of land through purchase of probate and um, this comes under APRA 
where anybody who has an interest in that allotment that we're probating or the tribe or the band, um, they they can initiate the process of purchase of probate. And uh, it's kind of a complex area. So we'll go into that also a little later on. I think uh, purchase of probate is August 2nd. And Mandy, like I said, Mandy has a couple for probate. And by all means, if you have any questions, uh, let us know and we'll be more than happy to help. Um, and then I'm going to go back here a little bit and go. This is again, this is the contact information. Uh, my telephone number you can reach me at. Uh, I am presently teleworking as the majority of our staff is teleworking, but we do call in, check the messages. We have access to email. Uh, we have phones. We can give you a call back. My number is 218-755-6760. Mandy Priester, 612-725-4591. Uh, Again, um, uh, Great Lakes. I didn't get her telephone number, but uh, you know, if you get a hold of me, I can direct you to Marion or somebody at uh, Great Lakes. Uh, Tracy Garno, 906-632-6809. Uh, give us a call if you have any questions. And um, that's probate in a nutshell. If you have any questions, give me a call. Thank you. Thanks, Gwen. I'm going to pause here for any questions for probate. Not, not seeing any. Let's see if I have that in the later. Oh, um, let's see. Okay, Alex and Julia. I mean, probably said we may not, but please go ahead and unmute. It's Alejandro. Well, it sounds like a probate needs a good PR team because it sounds like to be a lot of important work, and uh, I wish you guys had the staff to do it all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good. Yeah, Patty, uh, I overlooked a couple of things. I, for some reason, I thought Christine was going to be um, speaking uh, later in the presentation on uh, on finance. So I do Hi. want to. Hello. Oh, this is Christine. I can speak about our, our program if if now would be a good time. Actually, that is coming up later in the yeah. Um, and then uh, I just wanted to introduce a couple of other staff. That's Amy Hunt. She is the property officer, regional property officer, uh, as well as Pris Priscilla Westland, who is the accounting officer. And then uh, again, um, Christine will will mention more about the program later in the slides. Thanks, Patty. Yep. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? All right. I know I just put a note in the in the chat myself, and that's just because um, I just wrote regarding probate. A common belief is that BIA determines heirs who will inherit, but it's actually the administrative law judge at office of hearings and appeals. So um, sometimes I, I believe that's a common belief um, among people out there is, you know, when is BIA going to do this survey and decide who the heirs are? Um, they don't. They just gather the family history and they, in the packet and submit it. You heard Gwen say OHA a lot. Um, that's the Office of Hearing and Appeals um, where the administrative law judge will be signed. So BIA gathers up all the information, the family history, maybe there's wills, maybe other things, other than the documents, and, and provides that all to the judge who makes that determination and will issue an order. Um, so I just wanted to make that clear because sometimes we get calls on that a lot. So all right, thanks, Gwen. Um, Thank you. 
All right, so moving along next, our next program that we have up is um, Division of Speech with us, Russell Baker. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Russell Baker. I'm the supervisor of the Division of Feed Trust. I um, joined the Bureau in 2002. Uh, I'm originally from Oklahoma. I'm an enrolled member of the Comanche Nation down there. And uh, what I did today is I put together a list of the most frequently asked questions regarding the division. And I'm just going to go through each question and then just talk a little bit about the division. And so let's go ahead and get started. Um, first thing that people want to know is what do we do? Now, obviously, we process fee to trust applications, but we also process reservation proclamations as well. There are actually five tribes in our region that uh, have chosen to participate. We have the Ho Chunk Nation, the Oneida Nation, the Mille Lacs Band, the Fond du Lac Band, and the Shakopee community. So basically, all we do is process proclamations and fee to trust applications for those five tribes. Uh, the next thing that people want to know is how do we operate? And we actually have a pretty detailed uh, memorandum of understanding that uh, all the tribes use. Each tribe has their own MOU, but they're pretty much identical. And our uh, current MOU for all of the tribes runs through uh, fiscal year 2026. Uh, the next question people want to know is, you know, how are we funded? Uh, and what we actually do uh, is the tribes that have choose to uh, participate, they take their tribal priority allocation funds that they get and they actually uh, send them back to us, send those funding back, reprogram, reprogram it back to us. And so we're actually funded by the tribes that participate. Um, then the next obvious question is uh, how much is the annual budget? And so the five tribes contribute 1,075,000 a year uh, to uh, fund the division of fee to trust. Uh, those costs are all, of course, shared by the participating tribes. Um, if there's any money left over, we actually uh, send it back at the end of the year. So tribes really only pay actual costs. So that's one uh, one good thing. And then uh, what are our reporting requirements? Uh, we actually do a monthly report. We do a quarterly report. We have quarterly meetings. We also present a budget uh, at the beginning of the year. And then we do a uh, expenditure report at the end of the year. So uh, quite a bit of reporting uh, to the tribes that participate. And then uh, how are we set up, how are we staffed? We have uh, one supervisor, we have a program analyst, we have several realty specialists, and we also have a dedicated environmental protection specialist that will do our phase ones, NEPA, and, and our CIPs as well. And uh, on the next slide, I um, yeah, there's a list of our staff. We, we do have some vacancies right now. Uh, but one thing I wanted to let everyone know that if you're interested in the proclamation proclamation process, uh, we will be doing a presentation on August 10th uh, for the Partners in Action Conference, so please register for that. And if you're interested in the fee to trust process, uh, we'll be doing a presentation on August 11th uh, regarding the recent changes to the fee to trust process. And then, of course, if you're interested in uh, the division, you know, please feel free to contact me for any uh, information. Thank you. Thanks, Russell. And now with both the Division of Feed of Trust um, having presented and Real Estate Services presenting, um, I just want to remind any tribal leaders out there that um, a quarter of the reports on the status of your applications are sent out um, each quarter. Um, so if the Division of Feed of Trust is handling your Feed of Trust um, application or whether Real Estate Services is, either at the region or at the agency level, um, all offices are required to send out quarterly reports to the tribal leader on the status of your application. So watch for those. Um, those are sent out each and every quarter. I just wanted to add that. Any questions for the division of the Thank you, Patty, and good morning, everyone. Uh, well, I want to thank you for attending this morning. My name is Heidi Gordon, and I am the LTRO manager for the Midwest Land Titles and Records Office. Our office has been in operation since 2015, and we are located in Ashland, Wisconsin. 
Prior to our office coming on board, all records were administered by the Great Plains LTRO in Aberdeen, South Dakota. We're going to just touch on a few simple things this morning. And if you just can't seem to get enough of us, please feel free to join our longer LTRO presentation this Thursday at eight o'clock. The total land base under administrative jurisdiction of the department, uh, excuse me, of the Midwest region is made up of approximately 1,345,637 acres of trust or restricted Indian land. Land is distributed to 36 tribes located across Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, Iowa, and Indiana. The basics of our land titles and records is the LTRO is the acceptance, examination, recordation, and certification functions, which provide assurance that records are accurately maintained, trust assets are properly safeguarded, and accounts are administered in accordance with federal law, current policies, and federal regulations. The Midwest LTRO has many key functions, and we are here to provide certified title status reports that show legal descriptions and encumbrances. We prepare and provide certified land inventories, which are also known as BIA INVs. We record land title documents that convey and encumber Indian land. We maintain landowner status maps and plats. We certify land title documents, and we maintain the Bureau's official automated land ownership database system known as TAMS, which is the Trust Asset Accounting and Management System. And it seems like you guys are gonna hear that word quite often uh, through our presentations. Currently, the LTRO has six employees managing title for five states. We have Lenore, Lori, Tyler, Rosemarie, Paul, and myself. All of the information is, uh, our contact information is on the slide provided here. We currently have three vacant positions. It's the supervisory legal instruments examiner and the legal assistant, which are both located in our Ashland office. And we have the cartographer which is located in Bloomington at the regional office. And we hope to have these positions filled very soon. Thank you for your time and attention this morning. And we sure hope you're able to join us on Thursday at eight o'clock. Have a wonderful day and thank you. Thanks Heidi, very nice. Um, any questions for Heidi for LTRO? All right, thank you very much, Heidi. Great, thank you. So next up, we have Forestry Wildland and Prior from Matt Anderson, who's program manager. And then Kitson, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Matthew Anderson. I am your BIA Midwest Regional Forester. I've been in place for about eight years. Uh, I'm also the point of contact for the Tribal Climate Resilience Program. Uh, that's a program that in the past 10 years since it was established has gone under various names, all of which basically mean climate change. Um, my portfolio of interests is basically trying to save the world. And I'm also pleased that my program's work is probably among some of the most photogenic in the region of any of the BI programs. Uh, not, to, not to disrespect my colleagues, but uh, we take prettier pictures than most people, and it was very tempting to just not say anything for the next five minutes and just show you a slideshow of some of the beautiful pictures that I've taken of the forests of the Midwest region over the past several years. They are some of the most beautiful places in the country that you can go to, and I encourage each and every one of you to, if you can, as soon as you can, get out into the woods and spend some time there. It's one of the best things you can do for self-care, and it's something good to do because it'll help you help you to remember who you are. On to the actual program, though. I think I skipped a slide. Yeah, Forestry and Wildland Fire is one single branch, and it we have a variety of things that we do, but three major program activities. There's Forestry Proper, which is managing forested lands to meet tribal objectives. Fire Preparedness, which is preparedness to go respond to wildfires when they occur and fuels management, which is to take steps treating the forest to try and ensure that wildfires do not occur or that when they do, they aren't as severe as they could be. 
So I will talk about each of these in a little bit greater detail. And uh, as everyone else has said, if you have any further questions, just contact me. I'm happy to talk about pretty much anything you want, particularly if it's woods related. And uh, if you want me to come and visit you, I'm happy to do that too and walk around in your woods and point out all kinds of neat stuff. On the forestry program, some facts about Midwest region forests. All of the land areas in the Midwest region are classified as forest. And basically, if you do not plow or pave land, it will grow trees. Now, we do have some forest inventory data on all of our forest lands. We don't have nearly enough. Most of our inventory data is out of date. And so as a result of that inventorying, going out in the woods and measuring trees and putting in plots and determining what's there, what condition it's in and what specific trees are, are there is one of our major activities. Each and every land area is covered by a forest management plan. Um, some of those plans are quite old. I think the oldest in the region dates from 1986 and almost nothing on any page is still relevant to the current reservation forest. Nevertheless, we are working with tribes uh, to try to update their plans and keep them as current as possible and to get them to accurately reflect tribal goals and objectives. And that's kind of a homework assignment I offer to any of you tribal leaders is please do read your reservations forest management plan. And if you don't think that accurately reflects your tribe's goals and objectives for its forested land, please contact me. And we can either I can either update you on what the current status of the update of the plan is, or we can start an update process. Uh, most of our larger reservations and some of our smaller reservations have forestry programs, and the nature of that forestry program at each location is dictated by the forest. Some locations have a lot of trees, a lot of acreage, and are able to do sustained forestry yield uh, management. Basically, traditional forestry of cutting down trees and growing new ones, trying to provide tr jobs and revenue. Uh, and some are more more like hobby forests, where the focus is on forest health and providing uh, cultural values, medicinal plants, and recreational experiences. Forestry program has two types of funding. We have our base forestry program, uh, which is kind of a fixed amount that we can't really do anything about. Uh, recurring funds that support personnel who actually do the work. Uh, so that's funds for payroll and travel and vehicles and whatnot. And then forestry projects, which are non-recurring funds, which are, as the name indicates, for specific land-based projects. Uh, there's usually a map where you can point to uh, a project that's that is associated with funding and we do forestry projects works in four sub areas uh, being forest development which is basically tree planting and thinning inventory and planning which as i mentioned was a major activity woodlands management which is management of non-commercial species that are nevertheless of importance to a tribe particularly cultural uh, culturally important species and then the Timber Harvest Initiative, which is a focus to try and assist tribes in harvesting more timber. Uh, it's kind of a commercial activity. Talk about fire preparedness. Preparedness, as I mentioned, refers to being prepared to respond to wildfires. Um, any given reservation may be protect, protected by its own local fire, fire management program or else by cooperators that we have cooperative agreements with. Um, in addition, the preparedness program sends qualified personnel from tribes and from BIA to assignments nationwide. And at this time of year, this is usually the time when we send people out west. Uh, however, thanks to the lingering drought, particularly in the state of Minnesota, we're keeping a lot of folks at home working on uh, fires uh, that are close to the Canadian border. The Funding process for the fire preparedness program is kind of a black box. We don't have a lot of influence on it. It's a high level thing that happens at the at a level above the Department of Interior uh, determining who gets what funding and it's a there's this complicated wrangling that goes on to filter the the funds down to the ground level. There have been several attempts uh, at modernizing that system during the course of my 20 year career with the Bureau and so far we are still using the same process that was in place in 2003, which everyone acknowledges is outdated. Um, 
A positive thing to say about fire preparedness funding, however, is that funding shares are tied to quantifiable data. That means that if you have a large reservation with a valuable timber crop and it is under threat for uh, burning up during the summer months, then you are likely to get more money than you would otherwise uh, than a smaller reservation with no trees. Uh, so one of the things that we can do to influence our funding is to just be timely and accurate in our reporting of fuels conditions of the incidents of fire, uh, how many and what extent they are and what they cost. Finally, the fuels management program uh, operates kind of as a hybrid between fire preparedness and, and forestry, as I described before. Fuel condition is assessed nationally and also regionally. We look, uh, look in greater detail at it at the regional level. And funds are allocated to specific on-the-ground projects based on risk assessment ratings. Uh, those projects can be carried out by tribal agency or regional foresters. We also have various cooperati cooperators that we work with, one of which is the Nature Conservancy. We just uh, established a cooperative agreement to do fuels projects with them, and that's been very successful. Uh, the emphasis is on providing experience and training. Basically, we don't have enough hands who do and have enough knowledge at doing fuels projects, and fuels projects are tricky and require a lot of qualifications that are imposed on us by the National Wild, Wildfire Coordinating Group. So we focus on getting as many people trained up as possible and giving them good positive experience at doing work on the ground with the ultimate goal of every location being self-sufficient. But in the meantime, we like collaborating and everybody gets together and goes, sets, goes to set the woods on fire. Uh, tribal goals and priorities are a major consideration of uh, fuels projects. We do a lot of work that is specifically geared for ecological restoration or for promoting cultural and medicinal plants. This spring, we did a lot of uh, burning projects specifically for the purpose of promoting blueberries, which to my mind is one of the most positive things you can do with, with uh, the ground. Uh, and one final thought on, on fuels is there are various authorities that allow tribes to work outside of the boundaries of their reservation, uh, particularly the Tribal Forest Protection Act and uh, various other good neighbor authority and, and other uh, authorities like that allow tribes to work on lands of tribal importance or adjacent to tribal lands uh, on Forest Service land or National Park Service or National Wildlife Refuge lands. So we can enter into agreements with those agencies and go do the work that needs to be done for the benefit of tribal interests. Those are the three major areas. As I said, we do a lot of other things as well. Uh, if you have any concerns or questions about those, please contact me. Uh, each of our statewide agencies has an agency forester. Their contact information is here. Please feel free to contact any of those individuals. And if you have any questions about the fire or fuels program, please contact Tom Remus. He's in Grand Rapids. Uh, all of us are happy to talk to you. That's all I have for you right now. If you have any questions, let, let me have them. Hey, any questions here? Okay. There. So, I don't have any hands up. So, thank you. Thank you kindly. All right. Our next program that we have is Branch of Water and Land Safety. And it'll be presented by Mary Mary. Thank you, Patty. Good morning. I'm a member of the Standing Rock Tribe, just as a little background. As the Midwest Regional Office Water and Safety Dams Branch Chief, I'm also the region's hydrologist and dam safety officer. Besides the Midwest region, I've gained experience working as a hydrologist with various focuses for the Midwest or for the um, Rocky Mountain region and also for the Northwest region. This morning, I'm gonna quickly go through my programs that I manage, which can provide support for tribal activities regarding water-based issues issues. Next slide, please. Water resources management planning and pre-development is the, the one that you'll receive the most um, the notices in the mail from me for um, requests for proposals. Those usually come out at around this time and the due date for those is usually toward the end of August. This program, these the funds for this program are for water quantification projects, which can include water quality components, 
but please note that this is not a water quality based program as we're trying to not duplicate any of the um, EPA programs. We haven't received any fiscal year 2021 funding this year yet due to some sort of hold up at central office. But once we receive the funds um, at the regional office, we'll get those awards out as quickly as possible because we are in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Um, and it will move fast once, once we get the, the money and start the process. We also have um, what's considered a educational program component within the water um, management program. And that is for tribal members who have graduated from high school and are between the ages of 18 to 30 years. The main purpose is to encourage higher education in water or to um, help um, the career development of someone who's already in that water-based field. The students will learn field methods for water data gathering during this four-week period. And um, they'll, at the end of the four-week period, they'll receive a four-month employment voucher that they can use with any tribal government across the U.S. Um, as long as that government is willing to take them on or a federal government agency. So it's a, it's a pretty, it's, it's a pretty good little program that they have going. Uh, water rights, I believe that as we start to face more and more drought situations in within this region, um, the tribes are going to are going to have to determine if the state's use of riparian rights and re reasonable use doctrine provides enough water for sustaining your activities on the reservations. The Winters Doctrine and Federal Reserved Water Rights are usually applied to tribal water rights in the West, um, but we may need to start considering those to protect water rights in the reservation in these riparian rights states that we are in right now. Uh, moving on to the dam safety program. This program is based on the Indian Dam Safety Act of 1994. We're currently preparing a new law to update the language and to also um, pinpoint and clarify information that's out there already. Our mission is to protect downstream residents from loss of life and property damage, which, which could be caused by a dam breach for any BIA or tribally owned dams which are on trust lands. The type of support that is provided is maintenance, monitoring, uh, comprehensive re reviews where we have people come out who are experts in um, dam safety engineering. Um, we have early warning systems that we can install. We have emergency action plans that we would de develop with the tribe. And we also have training that um, we can provide to the tribe. If you have any dams that you'd like us to consider for this program, please contact me on that one. Uh, the next one that I'm going to talk about is the, it's called FERC Hydropower Compliance, which is actually stands for Federal Energy Regulatory Commission Hydropower Dams. So every 20 to 40 years, hydropower dams are up for review and for a new license. This is when um, the conditions to mitigate any issues that you see as a problem um, can be added to the license. So if you believe that there's that there should be fish passage that should be included on the dam, then, then that is the time when we need to do it before the license gets renewed and it can be included within that license. We can provide assistance during the relicensing process um, to kind of guide you if you would like us to. We can also um, see about providing some funds for participation within these meetings. And when a licensee fails to provide compliance with these license articles after the license has been granted, we can actually help with um, just providing support um, through through um, writing letters and also discussions with other, other agencies involved. Next slide, please. This is one of my um, sessions that I'm gonna be giving this year. It's gonna be on August 3rd from three to four. It's regarding the, um, the big activity that's happening right now because we are ending or we are nearing the end of a number of licenses. So um, during that, it, it takes like two to three years for a license to get developed um, for an application to be submitted to FERC. 
So um, we're going to be seeing over 100 hydropower dams entering this process over the next 10 years. These dams, um, many of which are in ceded territories, can impact your fishway passage, like I mentioned before, and po potentially it could be impacting other treaty rights that um, you were maybe sitting there going, I wish this dam wasn't there, otherwise this could be occurring in our in our river. So there, there are ways that we can talk to um, the licensee during the process. Um, if you guys choose to do it yourselves, please notify our office that you have had this interest in any dams at all, um, because we can try and provide some sort of funding to um, assist you with your, your work that you're performing at these during this process. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another session that I'll, I'll be having. It's on August 4th from one to three. It has to do with a huge um, project that's going underway for the entire, um, all the states that are surrounding the Great Lakes, basically. Um, this is a governance project that's underway to seek to understand the policies being followed by by um, the different entities, tribal, state governments, and large metros who are authorized to do some sort of regulation or who are authorized to perform the regulation um, regarding groundwater. Um, so the tribes, we figure that you guys have a say over how you're, how you're pulling water out. You might have your own policies out there that are not written, but they're policies that everybody knows within within the tribal government that this is what we follow. We don't allow um, wells to be downstream from or downhill from a septic system. We don't allow um, wells between a house and Lake Superior, that type of thing where it's it's in your, you guys know it, your people know it, but you just never written it down. So this is the type of information we're looking for too. The project lead for this program is the Freshwater Society. It's a public nonprofit organization which is dedicated to preserving freshwater resources. And they're collaborating with the Bureau of Indian Affairs and with Glyphwick at this point in time. This project will involve data gathering through internet searches and through interviews, um, comparing policies from all the stakeholders. And it's gonna end up with a guiding document that has recommendations for common policies. And it's also gonna provide um, suggestions for best management practices. And we're hoping to encourage and open up discussion and communication between all the entities involved so that we can ensure a more sustainable use of water and, um, and that we'll have continued water for the, for the Great Lakes region. We're currently scheduling and performing interviews with tribal staff and we're trying to determine ways of pulling that information into some sort of workable um, table. So it's we're hot and heavy right now with this um, with the interview section um, with the tribes. The the interviews have already been completed with the states. Obviously, there's a lot fewer um, people to speak to within the states than there are with tribes. So we're trying to make sure that we're capturing all the information possible. And we're hoping to be completed with our interviews by the end of July so we can move on to our next points. Um, for inf more information on this project and the current status as of you know, March or August 4th, please join us for the, for the session. Next slide, please. Here's my contact information. And this concludes my talk. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to ask for ask now or else you can also contact me at any point. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Thanks, Mary. Any questions out there? From Mary, in the branch of water and the All right, not seeing any right now. I'm going to move ahead quickly to the Division of Energy and Mineral Development. Good morning. My name is Winter Jojola Talbert. I am the Deputy Division Chief for the Division of Energy and Mineral Development. Um, I'm ha so happy to join in the Partners in Action Conference again. Um, we are a nationwide office. Uh, we are now under Trust Services. And our whole point is to help tribes 
If they have an interest in developing their energy or mineral resources, help them do that in an uh, environmentally sound manner um, to bring about some economic uh, diversification um, and in a sustainable way. So we're basically wanting to serve as your staff um, engineer or energy and mineral experts. So, you know, if you don't have one on staff or even if you do and you just want some outside support, uh, we are free support for you. Uh, so we do both technical assistance and business advising related to energy and minerals, as well as we do have our grant programs. So we have two of those. One is the energy and mineral development program. This one is geared towards basically all your pre construction, like pre actually building a project. So it could be feasibility. It could be looking at markets. It could be um, designing engineering design of a project. Um, a whole variety of things, but we can't actually purchase the equipment or develop the project. So we want to get the tribe you to a point where you can either get um, financing through a loan, loan guarantee, or maybe you want a partner to go into it with you, or maybe the tribe's going to self fund. And so we want to help reduce the risk of the project at the beginning and hopefully get the project to the point where you're able to finance it and move forward. Or on the flip side, it also is a win for us. If you look into a project and we decide, you, you know, you decide this isn't the best use of our funds or the best use of our time, or this isn't going to accomplish the goal that we want it to. That's a win for us too, um, to help get to those decisions without uh, using a lot of your own funds. Our other grant program is the Tribal Energy Development Capacity Program, TEDC as we call it. Um, this is related more towards getting your business and regulatory um, aspects in place to help support energy development. And so that could be putting together, um, you know, local, local, so tribal regulations or guidance, you know, however you want to do it, but getting um, yourself more in a place where you can better manage energy projects on the reservation. Next slide, please. Um, when we talk about energy, uh, we also like to remind folks that it's not always about the megawatts um, or the BTUs. So, you know, there's electricity and there's a heating, cooling component to energy. Both play really big parts, especially um, in an area like yours where, you know, it can get really, really cold in the wintertime um, and equally pretty hot in the summer. It's not just about the electricity. It can also be about heating and cooling, but also for us we like to view the different types of energy and minerals as more of tools so what is the goal you're trying to achieve and then can these natural resources provide as a tool some sort of solution to help you get to those goals so if you want to develop jobs you know solar might not be the tool you want to use. Usually solar can have a few more jobs with construction, but once it's built, not very many. Um, but maybe solar helps you provide reliable energy. Um, so it's really just about aligning those tools to achieve different goals and choosing that tool that solves the problem. Um, so that's what we help discuss with tribes a lot. Uh, we do have an upcoming session. Um, it's going to be on Thursday, I believe. And if I was organized, I would tell you what time. Hold on one quick second. And I can tell you that. Uh, uh, the 23rd from 1 to 2.30. And we will be discussing our programs, the ways we can help. Um, and I know there's always a special interest in renewable energy, and especially with this administration, I do believe uh, with the additional funds that might be out there um, with this administration, there's going to be a lot of companies uh, with technologies or consulting services that are going to be knocking on everyone's doors, um, you know, to try to 
uh, get a piece of that pie um, and hopefully help you out. But we've also prepared a list of different questions you can ask. Um, I, everyone can come up with these. But if you just want a quick, easy uh, list of questions you can ask just to find out what their experience really is, or if it's a technology, how mature is that technology? Has it been done at the intended scale before? Or has it only been done in a lab? Or was it only done in a small project in a city in Africa where you can't talk to anyone there, which we have had uh, technologies approach us with that before. Um, so it's just a quick list of kind of due diligence questions uh, that you can have on hand. And we're hoping to get that on our website soon too, um, just for easy access, because I do think there's gonna be a lot of interest in working with tribes on projects like that. And some of them are gonna be great and some of them are gonna be uh, perhaps a little more optimistic about their technologies or assistance that might be useful. So I think I'll wrap it up with that. Um, I thank everyone. And if you have any questions, oh good, I did put my contact information, thank you. Um, so Steve is the division chief. And there's myself, Winter Jojola Talbert, and please feel free to reach out uh, with any questions that you may have, comments, follow up, and hopefully we'll see some of you at our session on the 23rd. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Winter. Um, all right, next up, oh. for any questions. Oh, Verbal has a question, has a hand up. Verbal? Yeah, Winter, I wanted to know if your program assists tribes in the development of their Terra agreements, their tribal energy resource development agreements, or uh, TITOs, tribal right. energy development organizations. So we, our group doesn't do that directly, but I do um, have the contact information of the group that does. It's done through the Indian Energy Service Center. And I'd be happy to uh, put that in the chat here. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Marvel. Um, any other questions, comments before we move ahead? Okay. All right, our next program is Branch of Wildlife and Parks. Uh, this will be presented by Program Manager Sheets Acting. Filling in right now, Albany Jackson Ecker. Thanks, Patty. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm a Bad River Tribal member, and um, I'm a Great Lakes Restoration Biologist, one of two um, for the Branch of Wildlife and Parks. Um, the uh, My counterpart is uh, Zach Jorgensen, who some of you may also um, have worked with as well. Um, I'm based out of the Great Lakes Agency in Ashland, and he's based out of the Midwest Regional Office in Minneapolis. Um, and then also in the Eastern region, we have uh, Harold Peterson, who also um, assists us with some of the New York, New York tribes that we serve with the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, which I will go over in a little bit. Um, so um, basically the branch of wildlife and parks um, supports um, the DOI's goal of Indian trust responsibilities by enabling tribes in meaningful exercise of their treaty fishing, hunting, and gathering rights, while also assisting tribes in the management, development, and protection of Indian trust land and natural resource assets. Um, and the support also allows tribes to monitor, protect, and restore native um, species and sorry, don't mind my phrase supervisor here. <laughs> um, and thousands of acres of fish and wildlife habitat um, while sim simultaneously supporting tribal self determination, traditional life ways, cultural revitalization, and load local food systems and economies. Next slide, please. Um, so we have a few types of um, programs that we run. Um, we have a few that come from the central office out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, and those are nationally awarded programs with about 3 million awarded in um, FY20. Um, and they was, 
those are the um, conservation law enforcement programs, um, endangered species, fish hatchery maintenance, um, invasive species or noxious, noxious weeds, which are um, two different programs. Um, and the uh, Tribal Youth Initiative, uh, which also supports um, students um, intern programs, and then also the regionally awarded programs with funds that come out of the Midwest Regional Office, the um, Circle of Flight, which um, deals with waterfowl, wetland, and wild rice enhancement, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, and then also we serve as a contact for pass-through funding, like um, rights protection implementation, which serve 1854 Treaty Authority, um, Cora Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority, and Glyphic Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. And then we also serve as a contact for the Lake Superior co-management of Wisconsin waters. Next slide, please. Um, so for a circle of flight, um, it's basically around 700,000 allocated annually, and it supports um, waterfowl, wetland, wild rice, um, and it's unique to the Midwest region. Again, like as said in the previous slide, it's not a central program, it's a Midwest one. Um, and so in FY20, we had over 1 million um, in requested and then 15 projects awarded. And FY21, we had a slight decrease, um, nearly 850,000 requested and then um, 15 projects were submitted um, for um, or awarded as well. Uh, next slide, please. So the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, um, that's a pretty big program. Um, it's actually um, administered by the Environmental Protection Agency, um, and it distributes funds to um, several um, several federal agencies of which BIA is one of the recipients. And overall, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative is over $300 million annually, and of that, um, BIA now gets around, sorry, uh, $15 million now through the new distinct tribal program, which was formed in FY20. And the Great Lakes Restor Restoration Initiative focuses on five focus areas, which are toxic substances and areas of concern, um, invasive species, non-point source pollution impacts on the shore health, um, habitat and species, which is the largest um, focus area by far, um, and then five future uh, foundations for future restoration actions. Um, so um, in FY20, uh, the funding request came about um, 19 million and 75 projects were awarded and then 20 capacity um, was awarded. So the um, BIA Great Lakes Restoration Initiative Program um, awards are broken up into two types. It's either projects um, or capacity, which supports the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, and then at FY21, we received kind of a decrease in request, um, obviously due to COVID and then also due to carryover as well. Um, next slide, please. And then finally, that's our contact info. Um, Jessica Koski, she is the branch chief of wildlife and parks, but she is um, leaving on July 26 to pursue a doctoral program. So the main points of contact are now me and Zach, and we do have a few vacancies available that we do hope to fill, but one um, is coming on uh, the 2nd of August, which is a program analyst, which should help us uh, with our capacity to, you know, just, um, do much more <laughs> just so uh, you know we're kind of swamped right now but um, we're we're lucky to have uh, some other positions moving and coming on board so we said oh, that's it thank you thanks Albany everybody loves your pity <laughs> so any questions for Albany all right um, moving ahead, um, last but not least, for the trust services side of the house, we have um, GIS, um, Christopher Katzmerich. Thank you, Patty, and good morning and welcome. My name is Christopher Kutchmark, as Patty mentioned. I am the Midwest Regional Geospatial Coordinator 
and I am grateful to have filled this newly created position as of October 2020 here at the region. It has taken an OBM circular executive order and an act of Congress, just to name a few, to finally recognize the need to organize and coordinate the collection and management of geospatial data that ultimately led to the creation of the 12 BIA regional geospatial coordinators throughout the nation. The combined directives and acts will improve collaboration across the agencies and stakeholders while reducing waste duplication and will provide oversight of the federal government's investment of geospatial data. I currently sit on the BIA Office of Trust Services recently chartered National Geospatial Committee that will help advise senior leadership on the applications of geospatial technology and the infrastructure to support the Bureau's mission and objectives. My roles continue to evolve and grow. Um, currently, I am working on determining regional geospatial needs as they pertain to each branch at the region and on a national scale. My position will provide GIS support and products to BIA staff and tribes, both regionally and nationally. Um, I have been and will continue to coordinate ESRI trainings made available for both tribes and BIA staff based on their requests or their collective needs. Many of you have received correspondence from me recently um, with ESRI courses and surveys. If you have not and are a GIS user or interested in becoming one, um, please just email me with your contact information. I'd be glad to provide any kind of information I can to get you up and running. Um, presently, the National Regional Geospatial Committee is working on geospatial data standards as they pertain to specific data sets within the departments of the BIA. I also serve as the Center for Geospatial Infrastructure across the region and across other cooperating agencies. Um, I work closely with the branch of geospatial support on a number of national projects as well, um, including helping out with the overseeing of the DOI BIA Enterprise License Agreement and requirements. And one ongoing important initiative is the implementation and development of a region wide GIS enterprise environment. Um, there are many goals and challenges that lay ahead, but realistically providing a centralized GIS that offers an authoritative, reliable data source is one of our main objectives, something that will create opportunities and expose opportunities that create value. And these goals will include creating geospatial data and software usable and accessible regardless of abilities while interconnecting those geospatial services to discover ways to integrate existing BIA data sets with a common geographic component. And finally, create an all-inclusive GIS enterprise environment that will facilitate the storage, the sharing, and the distribution of geospatial information products within our organization and beyond. Um, I thank you for your time, and I now pass it on to Indian Services, I believe. Thanks, Chris. Does anybody have any questions? All right. And now I'm going to turn it back over to Indian Services, Chris. Would you like to introduce your um, program managers? I already did. Okay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Scott Doig. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Doig. I'm the regional environmental scientist here at the uh, BIA Midwest region. I've been um, at the Midwest since 2004. Uh, prior to that, I worked for the Prairie Island Indian community in the Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe. Uh, today, I'm gonna talk just a little bit about the Division of Environmental and Cultural Resource Management at uh, the Midwest region. Um, our primary responsibility is ensuring compliance with uh, the federal environmental cultural laws, 
um, whenever there's a federal action. Um, so there's a lot of different types of federal actions. Uh, these include fee to trust acquisition, rights of way, road construction, leases, um, federal funding, mortgages, and um, pretty much any of the programs that are speaking today kind of come through um, DECRAM, as we affectionately call it, um, to gain um, a compliance for the different projects they do throughout the region. So when we get a compliance request, we take a look at that project and determine how, uh, what laws and regulations that it's going to need to comply with. And here there's a list of some of the more common ones, uh, National Environmental Policy Act, which I've heard a couple of times, uh, we call it just NEPA, uh, National Historic Preservation Act, uh, Threatened and Endangered Species Act, um, NAGPRA, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and then um, one of the kind of the, the bigger parts of our workload is fee to trust acquisitions, um, which has been mentioned as a, a definitely a priority in the region. And for um, some of you may be aware that for all phase one or for all fee to trust actions, uh, we have to do a phase one environmental site assessment to determine if there's any environmental liability on the parcel. So that, that takes up a large percentage of our workload. Um, next slide, please. So within DECRAM, um, we conduct four to 600 uh, NEPA and NHPA compliance documents per year. Um, you know, those can range from very simple, what we call categorical exclusions, um, which pretty much excludes you from uh, any further need for compliance actions, um, all the way to um, environmental impact statements. Uh, these are primarily gaming uh, for the Midwest region. We just completed two of them um, the last uh, fiscal year, and each of those projects take you know anywhere from three to five years and um, are can be quite expensive. Um, so there's a wide range of you know how much each of these projects takes in terms of time and, and resources. Um, you know, other services we provide to the tribes, uh, we do phase one archaeological surveys. We do have a two um, um, archaeologists on staff. We conduct phase one environmental site assessments, as I talked about. We do um, a lot of those uh, pretty much every year. Um, environmental assessments, which is kind of that mid range of the NEPA documents, um, not uh, in between a categorical exclusion and an environmental impact statement. Um, I already talked a little bit about the EISs for gaming applications. Uh, we currently don't have any active EISs in the Midwest region for um, gaming applications. And we do um, do a, a lot of technical and on-site support for tribal staff, um, anywhere from um, you know water resource question type of questions if they don't fall under Mary Many Deeds. Uh, department to um, underground storage tank compliance issues, that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, other cut types of training. We um, we're, were involved in some um, annual uh, NEPA training within the region. And um, if for during this um, um, partners in action, we have two um, presentations, one on the National Environmental Policy Act and one on the National Historic Preservation Act, if you are interested in in um, kind of digging a little bit deeper into either of those uh, compliance laws. Um, next slide, please. So um, we have six staff normally. Um, right now we're kind of operating um, without two of those staff due to vacancies. Um, one of them for the fee to trust consortium, the um, environmental protection specialist. We expect that person to come on board in August um, and their primary role is conducting the phase one environmental site assessments for those fee to trust actions. Um, so uh, again, I'm up there. That is my email. Uh, Tim Gaia is our regional archaeologist. Um, Bill Kurtz, he is our fire archaeologist. Um, we have two vacant environmental protection specialists, and then uh, we also have Fred Vanaventer, who's an environmental protection specialist that works out of the Great Lake Great Lakes Agency. So if there's any questions about any of the things I've kind of briefly covered here, please uh, feel free to reach out to any of us um, and uh, we'd be more than happy to help.
And that's all I have. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Scott. Not seeing any questions, we're going to move ahead to Charter Transportation. Todd Kennedy. Good morning. Hope everybody's having a fantastic, fantastic day thus far. My name is Todd Kennedy. I'm the regional road engineer for the Midwest region, and I work out of the Bloomington office. As the regional road engineer, I'm responsible for the administration of any transportation programs or funds that become available for tribes within the Midwest region. Today, we're going to touch on two of the primary programs that the tribes in the Midwest region receive funds from annually. The tribal transportation program, which is actually a a DOT program, it's not a DOI program, is jointly administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and the Federal Highway Administration's Federal Lands Highways Office. It's actually the largest program within the Office of Federal Lands Highway. The Tribal Transportation Program is part of the highway authorization. The current authorization is Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act, or the FAST Act. And its intention is to address transportation needs of tribal governments. Next slide, please. The Tribal Transportation Program provides tribes funding to address transportation needs for Indian communities to improve safety and public land access. These tribal transportation projects also play a big part in economic development and providing employment opportunities and promoting self-determination. Some of the activities that fall under the tribal transportation program is overall planning, long range transportation planning, project development. Under project development, you'll have individual project planning, survey, design, right of way, arc and environmental clearances, construction, safety studies and projects, bridge rehab and replacement, administration and some road maintenance to mention a few. Next slide, please. The Tribal Transportation Program is funded from the Highway Trust Fund. Funds are allocated among tribes using a statutory formula that is based on population and miles. The miles are the miles of roads that tribes have identified in their respective road inventories. And if you're looking for some light reading at night, uh, you can Look at 25 CFR Part 170 and find the regulations there that the program is administered under. Next slide, please. In fiscal year 21, the Tribal Transportation Program is funded $505 million nationally. Of those funds, about 32 million are available to tribes within the Midwest region. As mentioned earlier, the Tribal Transportation Program is established in the highway authorization. The current authorization, the FAST Act, actually expired at the end of fiscal, fiscal year 20. What that means is this year in fiscal year 21, we're operating under an extension of the FAST Act. What that also means is Congress is currently working on a new authorization. So probably the most important thing I can say this morning is make sure that you're reaching out to your congressional contacts and representatives and making them aware of any concerns you may have, any changes that you might want to see in the program, because uh, ideally they would come up with a new authorization between now and the end of the fiscal year. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of things officially, but there's been some good rumblings of some significant increases in funding, uh, potentially, um, but no change in formula. And uh, we've had a number of different formulas over the years. Some have benefited tribes within the Midwest region better than others. Um, so everybody should make sure they understand their current program and how historically they've benefited or maybe not benefited from some of the things that have transpired over the years. So any questions as far as how your respective tribe may have benefited or uh, not done so well in previous authorizations, don't, don't hesitate to give me a call and I can provide you all the background information you need to move forward and, and uh, make better, make educated decisions on uh, con when contacting your, your representatives. 
Next slide, please. The other program that we deal with primarily is the interior road maintenance program. While the tribal transportation program uh, was established for tribes to rehab or reconstruct existing bridges or roads or to build new ones, the road maintenance program is there to preserve, help tribes preserve existing roads and bridges. Some of the activities that the tribes use these funds to perform would be routine or emergency maintenance activities, such as snow and ice removal, mowing operations, clearing and grubbing, uh, patching potholes, uh, regrading gravel roads, etc. Next slide, please. The roads program, a road maintenance program is a, a TPA program, a tribal priority, priority allocation program. That's been funded annually, about $35 million nationally. Uh, probably that number has been pretty consistent for the last couple of decades. And of those funds, the tribes within the Midwest region receive a little over two, $2.5 $2 million. Next slide, please. Here's the contact information for some of the individuals within our roads program. Currently within the Midwest region, there's 19 staff within the roads program. Uh, those 19 staff are spread out throughout the region in six different locations. We try our best to get out as close to the tribes as we can so that we can provide better services. Uh, some of those services that we provide are general technical assistance and oversight, uh, planning, long we can help with the long range transportation plans, uh, surveys, designs, construction monitoring, coordination, with ARC and environmental and right-of-way clearances, and we do uh, bridge inspections. So if you have any questions on roads program, uh, the upcoming new authorization, uh, any services that we can provide for you, please do not hesitate to give us a holler. Any one of us can uh, point you in the right direction or uh, if, if we don't have the answer right away. So that's all I've got this morning. Hope everybody has a great day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brad. Not seeing any questions or hand, hands raised at this point in time, so we'll go right ahead um, and move to self-determination. Um, Michelle Corbine. Good morning. I'm Michelle Corbine. I'm a member of the Bad River Band, Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. I'm the regional self-determination officer and warding official. Uh, this slide. The purpose of self-determination is stated as is to promote and advocate maximum part Indian participation in the programs and services conducted by the federal government for Indians and to encourage and support the development of tribal capacity to better manage the opportunities and responsibilities of self-determination. In other words, this is for tribes to be actively involved for them to be in control of and deciding how to operate programs to best meet the needs of their individual tribal communities. Next slide. BIA self-determination is responsible for the award and the administration of Indian self-determination contracts, and those are what awarded under public Public Law 93-638 and under the regulations of 25 CFR Part 900. That's our primary um, focus. And as we're doing that, we are working with all of the other branches and programs and departments that you are hearing discuss their programs. We are taking those programs and um, providing contracts and the funding that's the programs determine and providing those to the tribes. Our second responsibility is to provide guidance and technical assistance to Indian tribes, tribal organizations, and BIA staff. This includes providing technical assistance regarding preparation of the contract proposals, answering questions regarding allowable use of funds, um, even how to prepare a budget, what are the contract requirements, and also ensuring contract compliance, including reporting requirements. 
And as I mentioned, in addition, we work with not only the tribes, but we're also providing that same assistance and educating our BIA program staff on self-determination. And we work jointly with them. We work together and rely on their expertise and guidance for all programmatic aspects of the contract. Thirdly, we resolve findings and question costs that are identified in the tribe's annual single audit reports. If there's no findings or anything um, that has any questions, there's no additional actions that need to be done. But for those that there may be issues, uh, we will assist the tribe in preparing corrective action plans and follow up and to as to how those issues can be resolved. We also review tribal administrative management systems, including the financial property and procurement systems. Again, if there's any issues regarding those systems, we would offer technical assistance and how to resolve them. Um, if there are bigger issues, we may assist in finding funding that the tribe could contract with somebody or or whatever it may be to again to resolve any of those issues. And it may be something such as updating finance, financial property or procurement policies and procedures. Um, that is a very time consuming process and it isn't routinely completed. So in many cases, the tribe's written policies and procedures are outdated versus their actual processes. <coughs> Excuse me. Next slide. Self-determination, we award not only BIA funding, um, but funds from also other components of the BIA or the, of the department and other agencies, <coughs> including the Bureau of Indian Education, which includes Johnson O'Malley funds, higher education scholarship funds, Office of Justice Services, which provides law enforcement and corrections funding, Federal Highways for the Transportation Program funding, Environmental Protection for the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding. At times we may have other funding, other state funding, um, funding from the USDA for Forest Service funds, and any other special initi initiatives, such as we've had for the past two years, the CARES Act, and this year, the American Rescue Plan Act funds. This table provides a summary of the total funding of approximately $115.8 million that were awarded to the Midwest Region Tribes during fiscal year 2020 under self-determination contracts. This does not include any funding that, what, that was provided to self-governance tribes. Um, currently, as has been mentioned, we are in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, we're trying to wrap everything up. We're receiving a lot of year-end funds, trying to tie back together any remaining funding and projects that's out there and have this all completed, you know, prior to year-end deadlines. And also preparing for the new upcoming fiscal year, fiscal year 22 at the same time. Next slide. Self-determination currently has a staff of five. Uh, we too, as many of the other programs, uh, have vacancies. Um, two of our five staff are certified awarding officials and serve as contracting officers for self-determination contracts. Awarding officials have the delegated authority of the secretary and have the responsibility for the award, modification, administration, and closeout of all self-determination contracts from beginning to end. Our workload consists of the administration of approximately 500 contracts. And as I mentioned, there are two awarding officials within the Midwest region. My duty station is located here at the regional office in Bloomington, and I'm responsible for the contracting tribes and tribal organizations located in Minnesota, 
Iowa, Michigan, and six tribes that are located in Wisconsin. Ms. Jody Zardin uh, is an awarding official as well, and she's located at the Great Lakes Agency, and she's responsible for five other tribes in Wisconsin. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at any time. And I want to thank you for your time and have a great day. Thanks, Michelle. Not seeing any questions or hands up. Um, give one quick look. Yep. So again, I just want to remind everybody, I did put a chat out there. We do value your time and it looks like we are going to go over our scheduled time. Um, if you do need to leave um, for your for your own scheduling purposes, um, just a reminder that this session is being recorded and that you can always come back um, to view the recorded session. Additionally, after the conference, it will be put um, in a public place for you to view as well. So again, I apologize that we are running over time. We're going to continue on. Um, if you need to leave, we will understand. Thank you so much. With that, we'll go to housing improvement program. Okay. Hello again. Uh, in case you just joined us late or something, uh, my name is Chris Redmond, Deputy Regional Director for Midwest Region Indian Services. And among the many programs within Indian Services, uh, the Housing Improvement Program, or HIP, is one that I work with directly. Now, the following is just a brief overview of the HIP program, uh, but I hope you can join us for a more thorough and targeted discussion in the HIP session uh, July 27th. I believe 8 a.m. according to uh, the uh, information that was provided. Uh, that, uh, by the way, will be presented by Mr. Leslie Jensen of HUD. So the Housing Improvement Program is a home repair, renovation, uh, replacement, and new housing grant program administered by the Bureau of Indian Affairs and federally recognized Indian tribes for American Indians and Alaskan Native individuals and families who have no immediate resource for standard housing. While not an entitlement program, HIP was established under the Snyder Act of 1921 as one of the several BIA programs authorized by Congress for the benefit of Indian people. Next slide. Thank you. To be eligible for HIP assistance, you must be a member of a federally recognized American Indian tribe or Alaskan native, live in a, an approved tribal service area, have an income uh, that does not exceed 150% of the United States uh, Department of Health and Human Services poverty guidelines. You also have, uh, you have present, you present housing that has been in, uh, substandard as defined by the regulations, have no other resource for housing assistance and have not acquired your present house or housing through a federally sponsored housing program that includes such housing assistance. HIP is a home improvement and replacement grant program that serves the neediest of the needy. American Indians, Alaskan Natives who have substandard housing or no housing at all and have no immediate source of housing assistance. HIP is a secondary safety net housing program that seeks to eliminate substandard housing and homelessness in Indian communities by helping those who need it most and who need most to obtain decent, safe and sanitary housing for themselves and their families. It is the BIA's policy that every American Indian Alaskan Native family should have the opportunity for a decent home and suitable living environment. And next slide, please. This is my contact information. Um, I, as I stated earlier, there's going to be a more thorough uh, overview of this and particularly more discussion on the uh, uh, reporting mechanism and, and the funding that will, is going to prop be available. There will be more discussion by that by less. So uh, feel free to contact me uh, uh, through this avenue and I'll provide any type of uh, assistance I can to assist uh, your, your tribe or tribal members 
and uh, with this with the HIP program. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Just checking the chat and um, don't see any questions um, related to HIP. Um, so moving right along, we'll go forward to tribal operations. Uh, Cheryl, go for it. Next slide, please, Patty. Good morning or afternoon, depending on your location. I'm just looking at the clock and I see we are really moving fast or slower than we initially intended. Welcome to an overview of the Bureau of Indian Affairs for new tribal leaders. I'm Cheryl LaPointe. I'm a member of the Red Lake Band and the Tribal Operations Officer for the Midwest Region. The branch of tribal operations provides technical assistance to agencies and tribal governments according to policies, regulations, and laws. We accomplish this through consultation and by providing assistance in all areas of tribal governance. Our goal is to promote, encourage, and strengthen tribal governments through self-determination. If your tribe requires technical assistance, Generally, the agency superintendent is your first point of contact, although this office, the deputy regional director for Indian services, Chris Redman, and the regional director, Tammy Putra, are also available to you. This slide provides a brief overview of some of our responsibilities in tribal operations. I won't go through all of them because, as Deputy Olby stated, copies of these slides will be provided. I do want to highlight one of our major responsibilities, secretarial elections. As a tribal government, secretarial elections are important because if a proposed amendment to a constitution is adopted through the secretarial election process, it will effectually change your governing document and possibly how a tribe accomplishes its goals and objectives. Next slide, please. This slide is a continuation of the previous slide showing our functions. We'll pause here for a couple of beats to give you a chance to look at it. Next slide, please. Anytime you have specific questions or need additional information concerning a tribal government issue, Please do not hesitate to contact your agency or this office. The contact information for all tribal operations staff are listed here. And this is all I have. So enjoy PIA 2021 and thank you for your time. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay, not seeing any questions. Uh... Four hands up. We're going to move straight ahead to Branch of Human Services, Valerie Vasquez. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Valerie Vasquez. I'm the Regional Social Worker for the Midwest Region. And for the purposes of working with your tribal governments, I'm also known as the Awarding Officials Technical Representative for Social Services Contracted Programs. This means I assist the awarding official in many aspects of your contract that is related to the social services program. Next slide. The Midwest region currently employs three master's level social workers, Jeremiah, Amber, and myself, all with varying experiences and strengths to support you, our tribal partners. This includes military duty, outreach services to homeless veterans, tribal urban foster care, adoption and residential programs, and lastly, BIA social service agency experience. There are no other BIA social workers within the Midwest region. The regional staff are your resource for social services. Next slide. So you may wonder what specifically the BIA regional social workers are responsible for and what exactly is it that we do. Although this is not all inclusive of all the work we do, I'll provide some highlights 
of the work that we do do. We provide technical assistance to tribally contracted social service programs. This, this may include providing assistance to the program and determining eligibility for services under the BIA regulations and any reporting assistance requirements. From time to time, a self-governance tribe may request technical assistance in which we will provide assistance to the program or tribal government. We are responsible to the awarding official in the oversight of all contracted social service programs to ensure programs are successful in carrying out their work. We're also considered the subject matter experts to the contract's statement of work and its relationship to tribal governments. We also assist when states and counties have difficulty in identifying a possible tribe for an Indian child in state custody. And related to that, we provide responses to official ICWA notices when they are sent to the BIA. And we also are required through the Secretary of Interior to ensure the protection of trust funds and to work to ensure beneficiaries are getting the need, their needs met when a request for a disbursement is made. Next slide, please. And we we like to provide training and where and when um, it's needed. Um, often tribes will let us know what kind of training they, they really would like to see. So we do that. Um, we also assist county and state partners in roundtable discussions with tribal programs to ensure a collaborative approach is being made on behalf of Indian children and, and their families. This also gives us an opportunity to be made aware of issues tribes are having with their surrounding county and state agencies. And we also participate in national work groups to ensure local issues are being considered. Okay, next slide please. And here is a list of the funding activities for the social services programs. I won't go into those specifically, but um, the slides will be a, a, a guide for you to understand and any questions you can surely reach out to me. Next slide, please. And these are the regulations um, that drives our work within the BIA social services contracted programs and provides you a brief description of what each of those regulations promote. At the bottom of the slide, I've also included a web page for electronic CFR for your reference. Okay, next slide, please. Oh, there is no next slide. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. If you have any questions that are specific to this presentation, please feel free to reach out to me by email or phone call. I'm available here to help you. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. Not seeing any hands up or anything in the chat um, as far as questions, so we are going to move ahead um, right into the facility management program. Gerald? Good morning. I'm uh, Gerald Doolittle, acting uh, facility manager for uh, Midwest Region, and uh, I'm also a regional safety manager. Uh, facility management and the, the program is to provide the mission authority, scope, internal controls, policies, and procedures for the execution of the Indian Affairs. Next slide, please. All these uh, programs are uh, the, the, the following programs right there is how I get the funding to you, operations and maintenance for your day-to-day, uh, -day, annual work plan uh, programs, minor improvement and repairs. That's basically uh, two hundred two thousand five hundred dollars up to uh, twenty twenty five uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Facility improvement is two hundred fifty thousand dollars up to uh, two million dollars, and then uh, of course uh, housing, space expansion, demolition, quarters and improvement. Most of this stuff is new construction, and this is where uh, I will be the direct liaison if you wish to go through uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, construction program. Most of the things I work with you will be operation maintenance and the minor improvements. A direct liaison with the uh, with your tribes on these projects. Next slide, please. For safety program, I'm in charge of uh, doing the annual property safety inspections throughout the region, and also managing uh, the the 
region-wide OSHA programs, which consist of hearing protection, fall protection, has hazardous material, combined space, bloodborne pathogen, PPE, look lockout uh, tagouts. And also during this past, uh, well now going on a year and a half, I've been the COVID-19 uh, uh, subject matter expert. And I've been uh, dealing with the tribal regulations and the CDC guidance throughout the region, talking about uh, our latest updates. And I'm also the Workman Compensation Coordinator. Any questions on all these programs, you can get a hold of me. Next slide, please. Uh, you know, you, there's my contact information. August 3rd, I am uh, going into detail for all three programs, uh, COVID-19 uh, updates, uh, safety management program, and also facility management, all on August 3rd uh, through this uh, conference. Thank you. Thanks, Gerald. We do not see any questions or comments. We're going to move forward to administrative services. Um, introduce um, Kristen Baz, Bazinet. Wait, I, I want to say it Bazney, Christine. I always do, but it's Basina. Um, that's that. No, that's fine. Uh, this is Christine. Thank you. Um, so good morning, I'm the administrative officer for the Midwest region and a tribal member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Indians. The branch of administration includes finance, property and acquisitions. Chris Redmond mentioned the, the people within our program earlier on and, and budget, but uh, Scott Cameron budget reports to Tammy Poitra directly. But again, I'm the administrative officer, Christine. Accounting officer is Priscilla Westland. The property officer is Amy Hunt. And our acquisitions is handled by the Southern Plains Regional Office. We have a service level agreement in place with them. So the branch provides leadership, oversight, and support to all programs in the region and agencies relating to human resources planning and development, effective management of government-owned property, vehicles, office space, inventory control, excess and surplus property, and for providing accounting advice and assistance to the regional director, program managers and supervisors, agency superintendents, and some tribal contacts. Basically, we work really hard behind the scenes on the financial and property management functions for all trust and Indian services programs, including property management for BIA schools, Office of Just Services, and some tribal facilities. Please reach out to any of us if you have any questions. And that is the end of my report. Thank you very much. Thanks, Christine. Okay, we do have one slide up here on FOIA, and I'm not sure. Michelle, are you are you prepared to talk a little bit yep. about FOIA? Yep, and I'm still here. All right, thank you. Regarding the Freedom of Information Act, we just wanted to put in a few comments here. Um, it is referred to as FOIA, and the purpose of FOIA is for open government and to provide the public transparency regarding the government actions. FOIA provides public access to federal records. This does not include travel records that are located at tribal facilities and that the tribal tribe creates and maintains. It's important to remember this is for federal records only. FOIA does not, as FOIA is includes in is our request for federal records, it does not include general inquiries, such as requests for research or a list of questions, but it is for federal records only. All FOIA requests must be submitted in writing, provide basic information regarding the requester, such as the name, contact information, and a clear description of the records sought. Um, there's a link here to provide it online, or it could be, your request could be mailed in. Um, in addition, <coughs> there to processing, 
Sometimes travel requests may be processed under the FOIA process. If that's all I had regarding FOIA. Thank you, Michelle. All right. Um, seeing no questions, I'm going to move forward to property. It's Amy Hunt. Good morning, my name is Amy Hunt. I'm the Regional Property Officer here at the Midwest Region Office. I'm a member of the Bad River Tribe. And this morning I wanna go through a very brief overview of GSA. This program is great to have specific programs to receive equipment at a great cost or sometimes free. <clears throat> GSA Access is an entry site for the Federal Access Personal Property Utilization and the Federal Surplus personal property donation. It is operated through GSA, which is the General Service Administration. The site is available specific for only contract or compact tribes and is not intended for the general public. So the federal surplus <clears throat> donation site is it's to obtain the excess personal property that is accessed to all federal sources. Property that can only be requested under the 638 contract or a self-governance compact agreement. No medical supplies can be accessed through the BIA. They must go through the Indian Health Services, Services and that is Louise Armstrong, the property management officer. Next slide. So in order to request for GSA access, you have to receive an AAC. So in order to, to freeze and to screen any property within this website, you have to send out a letter to us at the BIA. And within the letter, we must have the contract or the grant number, the name of the contract or grant program, housing, forestry, roads, the start of the compact or contract um, dates and the expiration of that, those contracts. The designated persons within that um, letter has to have their full name and also they have to, there's only two people per tribe that can get this screener access. The tribal request letter must be on tribal letterhead and signed by the tribal leader. Next slide. So this is another letter if you request um, at the BIA, we, out, we have excess property that and equipment that we can give to the tribe. And the same rules apply. So you had have to have the contract or the grant number within that, that letter, the name of the, <clears throat> the program that it's gonna be given to and the reason of what the use would be. The start and expiration dates of that contract number and a complete list of the equipment and it would have to be on tribal letterhead and signed by the tribal leader. Next slide. And these are the individuals at the agencies that you would put your letter, you'd address it to Diane Baker for Great Lakes, Jason Overly for Michigan, Alan Fogarty for Minnesota, or Tammy Poitra for the Midwest region. And as the accountable property officers for all of the agencies <clears throat> work with them they know exactly they work with the programs so anything that's access to the agency they have a list and they can also um, help you step by step on how to receive the gsa access package and i also if you email me i will once we get the letter completed for the gsa i will submit there's an application process we have to go through also and if you have any questions, please feel free to get a hold of me. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Amy's contact information was on her first slide, um, which you will all get a copy on uh, this presentation. So seeing no questions, I'm gonna move ahead to Scott Cameron, our budget officer. Hello, everybody. Um, bear with us. We're almost to the end. They're saving the best to the last here. OK, so within with these three slides, I'm going to let you know who I am and in a nutshell what I do for you in the BIA. I'll be also be doing a budget 101 session. 
if you haven't signed up for that, you can always do a late registration with Andrew Ainsworth and we'll get into the budget in more detail there. So welcome. I am Scott Cameron, the Midwest Region Budget Officer. A little about me, I'm a member of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians. Uh, retired 25 year veteran of the United States Marine Corps and the Army National Guard. I began my career in the Department of Transportation, loved working with the tribes, providing safe roads and construction, and did that for about 18 years. Then I transitioned to the admin officer for the Great Lakes Agency, which pretty much I was involved in everything for the agency at that point. Then most recently, August of 2020, I moved as the budget officer of Midwest region. I enjoy outdoor gathering. I stay pretty much busy. So I will cover the meat and potatoes. You can always contact me for further questions. Um, and if you want to dive deeper into the Budget 101 course, that's August 3rd, 10 to 11. Next slide, please. And then click. I'm always able to be reached for any questions you have. If you don't, if I don't have the answer, I'll find the answer for you, or I'll direct you somebody that's subject matter expert to provide that information. First of my many hats I wear is Indian Affairs Performance Measures. In the government, we are great at providing acronyms and abbreviating phrases and sentences to initials. So it's known as IAPMS. Performance management is at its core focus on collecting, reporting, and managing program results and outcomes. It is the BIA's report card. We define strategy, we implement the strategy, we evaluate the strategy all tied to the department's strategic plan. Ensure the reporting requirements are complete, accurate to central office. It isn't something that you normally see, um, but for you to know that we are doing the best we can, we are held to high standards. The performance management is directed by the Government Performance Results Act, GEPRA of 1993, which was updated to the Government Results and Modernization Act of 2010. Good thing to remember with performance is performance is always tied to money. Click please. And then enter one more time. My next head is Office of Self-Governance Coordinator. I review annual and multi-year funding agreements along with the actual annual reprogramming request for the actual money. By provide recommendations to the regional director. Um, the Office of Self-Governance and what I do as a coordinator is a team approach. At times with self-governance, tribal self-governance coordinator, myself, regional director, whatever we have to do to get the job done. Um, we provide funding moves from Midwest region projects to Office of Self-Governance to get it to the tribes. Additionally, I'm a part of the regional team for the 105 lease agreements. And then enter. And enter one more time. My next hat is my budget duties. That's my main focus. Budget formulation. Um, I wanted to thank everybody. A special thanks to the tribes in providing the ranking tool information. I know I can be a bit of a pain. I send out emails and reminder emails, but we are one of three regions in the nation to have 100% of our tribes voicing their concern and ranking their priorities. And we were the first of all the regions of the 100% of all the regions that submitted it ahead of time. So outstanding work on the tribes part. I collected that, I processed that. It's y'all's voice that was heard. So one thing in Indian country is the differences with each tribe specifically from coast to coast or shoreline to shoreline in our own region. The uniqueness of budget formulation is that the national rankings are so similar to our regional rankings. It goes to show the needs in Indian country are the same from shore to shore. The next thing I do as budget duties is I kind of the shaker and baker with money, making sure it moves point A to point B. Um, I get requests from central office, I get funding coming down, I get money going back, I get funds from the region to the tribal lines, um, from Midwest region to self-governance, 
to be distributed to self-governance tribes. Additionally, that helps certify funds for requisitions, which is a pathway to receive your funding in public law 93-638 contracts. I review the Midwest region budget plans, keep track of um, tribal priority allocations and program allocations to ensure we are not in the negative or funding sitting there, just not getting out to the tribes quick enough. I'm sure a lot of the programs could attest to the fact that I can be a little annoying on my emails. If we have money there, I want to get it out as fast as we can to the tribes so they can use it as appropriate. I spend the, my spare time in looking through the Green Book. I encourage everybody to read the Green Book. It provides a lot of insight in the presidential's budget. Um, and it provides actual descriptions, use or intent of the program funding. And the Green Book's a uh, little bit later, a few slides, you're going to have a resource page. Um, I would capture that and save that. That's an excellent opportunity to have all your resources in one place, and the Green Book is there. Enter, please. And enter one more time. Lastly, uh, I do a lot of special projects. Most recently, I was involved in a career fair for diversity. A couple of years ago, the DOI reorganized and the tribes didn't want to be part of that reorganization. Well, the Midwest region predominantly falls within region three of the DOI's new region organization. So we teamed up with region three, our federal partners to provide a career fair, and we notified all tribal leaders, all tribal primary and secondary education facilities, and we provided training on USA jobs, because if you've ever applied for a federal job, you know that USA jobs is quite interesting to navigate through. We provided key pointers for building a government resume. It's not the old story of one or two pages. A government resume is much more in detail. Um, we also had examples of the intern programs and opportunities for students in secondary facility education to take a path in their life. And also the key leadership explained the joy of supporting our tribes in Midwest region. I also provide data calls a lot of them you wouldn't directly affect the tribes, they're administrative in nature, but some of them, to name a few, is I assisted with the tribal certified enrollments that recently happened with tribal government, tribal ops, I helped with that. Um, I do the support with the base or CTGP or consolidated tribal government program, the base changes. Also with the pay cost adjustments for the fiscal year and calendar year tribes. And the last thing I want to mention is end of year funding request. A letter was sent out to the tribal leaders on January 12th, 2021. And the key to this is, you know, with the pandemic, there's less travel, there's less expenses. Uh, if funding becomes available, we have a list of tribal projects or proposals. I encourage you to pull up that letter. If you need it again, let me know. I'll send it out again and put in tribes request for end of year funding it's a one-time thing it's not a contract obligation um, if funding becomes available from the region central office wherever it happens um, we'll look at that list and see if we can help the tribes in one more way thank you it is my pleasure assisting you are there any questions I'm not seeing any questions, Scott. Thank yes. you. So I am Scott Cameron again. My email is scot.camerom at bi.gov. And my cell phone number is 715-292-9654. Um, and I will be followed by the Office of Self-Governance. Ken, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, next. We're moving forward, as Scott mentioned, to the Office of Self-Governance. We have Tony Reinfeld, who will be presenting. Ken? Good morning to everybody. Uh, uh, I feel like a, a, a child of the Midwest region. I work very closely with, uh, with the Midwest region. The origin of the self-governance tribes 
and their funding and their inherent federal functions uh, are all in the Midwest region are, are related to to what your office does. It's a great pleasure. It's a so a, a very productive relationship and I know of great value. The Office of Self-Governance manages the Tribal Self-Governance Program under Title IV of Public Law 93-638 as amended. Uh, it, they came from the 638 contracts, the Title I, and have evolved into operating under Title IV. Next slide, please. What do we do in uh, FY 2021? We've entered into 133 annual or multi-year self-governance funding agreements, and we're covering about 289 tribes and different consortia and obligated, that's, this includes the American Rescue Plan funding as well, over 1.177 billion dollars. So uh, our parents did well in terms of uh, spawning the self-governance tribes. Next. Patty, could you get the the next slide? Um, I did advance it, so I'm on the last of your slides. OK, uh, all right, thank you. Uh, part of the difference uh, when you become a self-governance tribe, you move from a 638 contract to Title IV authority, which enables uh, the tribes to redesign or consolidate their programs and to reallocate the funds for the programs in their negotiated funding agreements and, and kind of tailor their operations to be in line with the best interest of the, uh, the community that they're serving. And so I, I value, greatly value the, 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 the origin and, and the current functions uh, and the partnership that we maintain with the Midwest region. It's great working with them. And that's what I have. Thanks, Ken. And you'll be teaming up with Scott in the Budget 101 session as well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, so... That will be coming up later. I believe that was on Scott's presentation, the exact date. But if not, everybody refer to your course catalog. Um, sign up for that. We do have one more slide. Um, I'm not seeing any questions or hands up, so I'm going to move forward. This last slide is is regarding the solicitor's office. Um, so um, our offices work very closely with the solicitor's office. And I guess just one takeaway from this slide is um, the, the BIA Midwest region um, is advised um, by the solicitor's office, um, Northeast Region, which is located in the Twin Cities. So um, they perform the legal work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So Bureau of Indian Affairs is their client. So um, we have that attorney-client relationship with the solicitors. So um, and, and we look to them for many um, legal opinions or advice. Um, and that's who they are. And on the very last day of PIA, uh, of the Partners in Action Conference, they too have, have their own session scheduled. And if you have missed registration or you have heard um, a program manager discuss that they will have um, a PS session coming up. Take a look at your course catalog. It's still not too late to edit your registration. You um, obviously registered for the conference because you're here. Um, but if you 
want to add classes or courses that you didn't think you'd be interested in that maybe this question sparked an interest, um, you can go ahead and edit your responses on your registration. Just use that same link and edit your responses. Um, we'll do everything we can to get you in. It takes a little, it takes a little while. So give us some, um, um, you know, a couple of hours anyway. So it's not, it's not by any means an automatic process. There's some manual labor that needs to happen. Um, so with that, we have uh, BIA resources um, we that have um, been mentioned throughout these presentations. Um, and there's links in the back here. Several of them, I won't go through them all. Um, here's your contacts. Um, Regional Director Cammie Poitra, uh, myself and um, Chris Redman, um, the other deputy, um, our contact information. And um, finally, going on to the very last question um, slide. So I don't see any hands up. Um, or in the chat. Um, so just just to remind you all to um, that this was recorded and will be available for um, viewing later. I want to thank everybody for attending today and hanging hanging out with us for um, for as long as we did. Uh, we did go over about forty minutes. Um, this is the first year that we have put something like this together that included a very high level review of all of our programs um, into one consolidated presentation. Um, so thank you so much for your patience and your time um, because we did go over. Um, so um, also, I guess one last um, acknowledgement and thanks. Um, I had a lot of help. Uh, um, Carol Brown, who had actually put this, um, put the content, um, not all of the content, but put the or order of the slides and coordinated with all of our program managers to get their input. So thank you very much, Carol, for all of the help on putting this together. And of course, this was the first year of version one. Uh, version two is, is probably going to be improved. For next year, we'll have it timed right um, and scheduled accordingly. So with that, everybody uh, have a great day. Enjoy the rest of the of the PIA conference uh, later this afternoon. If you're not registered, um, um, edit your responses. Uh, we do have an interesting session coming up. Uh, streamlining BIA's processes. It's going to be a roundtable discussion, um, and that is there's not going to be a PowerPoint. Um, we're hopefully everybody's going to be engaged in active discussion and recommendations on how we can streamline some of the processes that you've heard about today. So thank you very much, and I hope to see you this afternoon. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty.